So our third speaker is Ethan Adelon. He is associate professor of history at Sciences Po in Paris. And she also holds a degree. Among the other words, he published uh, Les Batailles de l'Impôt, Consentement et Résistance, 1789 à nos jours, published at the Edition du Seuil. He has co-edited on uh, several volumes, including one entitled Pour une histoire monde. He's also editor of the web magazine La Vie des Idées, and his paper is entitled La Dette des Gueules Cassées, Public Subscriptions, Moral Obligation, and the Memory of War in 1931 to 33. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles, for setting up uh, this uh, wonderful panel. It's an honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you in advance to uh, Natalie for her comments and to uh, David to help me uh, complying with um, my time obligations. So don't <laughs> hesitate to stop me. I can't thank you. So uh, the piece of research I'm presenting today is um, part of a wider project. It's not the core of my current research, but uh, it's part of something I'm dealing with actually at the moment on the politics and culture of uh, public subscription in early 20th century France. So the title is La Dette des Gueules Cassées, uh, Public Subscription, Moral Obligation on the Memory of War in 1931-1933. On the 3rd of February 1933, the Galerie Dorée of the Bank of France welcomed the prestigious ceremony judging from the distinguished members who took part in it. The President of the Republic, the General Governor of the Banque de France, the Minister of Pensions, the Police Prefect, and many others were invited to the final drawing of a lottery organized by a bunch of head injured vet veterans, here they are, who for two years had sold millions of tickets, raised 39 million francs, and triggered a national movement of solidarity. La dette, as this operation was coined, aimed at fostering the public's generosity toward the girl cassée, playing on the memory of the First World War and the sense of moral duty that should derive from it. This episode, I will argue, offers a good case study to think about the culture and politics of obligation. It is sometimes assumed that France, compared to other countries, especially the US, has always been lagging behind as far as gift practices and philanthropy are concerned. Voluntarism and civic particip participation would be typically American, whereas French would mostly rely on the state to finance social spending and promote solidarity, therefore leading to some sort of diminished civil society. So this is the Tocquefillian account of this uh, comparison. However, too, this picture leaves aside significant episodes during which the French population was highly solicited to contribute to charity or patriotic causes. That was especially the case just after the Great War, when the war veterans' movements, representing more than 3 million people, was at its climax. Subscription lists were open to build war memorials, give head to orphans, or help veterans' associations to take care of their members. It is precisely in those years that anthropologist Marcel Mauss published his famous essay sur le don, in which he sought to understand the moral and social foundation of gift practices in traditional societies, as well as in modern societies. As many scholars have reminded us, we'd rather be wary of liner and evolutionary views according to which gift would be a thing of the past, bound to disappear with the growth of modern redistributive states. The interwar period, on the contrary, showed how a dramatic increase in the fiscal power of the state could go hand in hand with booming charitable fundraising. Of course, the girl Cassé embodied the perfect example of a just and moral cause. Those disabled veterans who had fought for the nation and suffered in their flesh and blood kept weighing on their face the scars and atrocities of the Great Wars, as Chris Class reminded us uh, uh, yesterday. Their distorted faces were both a reminder of the world's monstrosities and of society's unwillingness to reintegrate them after the war. The moral value of their call for the nations and the sense of guilt and obligation it inspired among the population could in no way be questioned. But this altruistic motive was only part of the story. The debt was at the same time an act of solidarity and a lottery. It appealed to moral sentiments and self-interest, to generosity and love again. The Girl Cassé proved particularly efficient in dealing with the business of solidarity, since fundraising requires, indeed, not only feelings and generosity, but also sales methods and mobilization strategies. Furthermore, their operation granted more respectability to a financial operation, the lottery, that had always been perceived as immoral. 
the social and political context in which Parliament finally decided to recreate a national lottery to fund veterans' pensions in May 1933, reveals how earmarking processes, to use uh, Viviana Zelizer's famous category, could move boundaries between money, morals, and interests. Although based on a voluntary basis, lottery games entered the politics of obligation and became a substantial resource for both war veterans and the state. So when the Gulkas decided to launch their subscription, their financial situation looked terribly gloomy. Founded in 1921 by Free Blessé de la Face, the association was set up to provide moral and financial support to approximately 6,000 disabled veterans. It belonged to a galaxy of newly created specialized associations which targeted specific veterans in opposition to the more general and political, political sorry, Union Nationale des Combattants or Union Fédérale. The association played a crucial role in advocating for the development of maxillofacial surgery, which is a well-known point. But their social reintegration was much more precarious in practice. The association does try to offer assistance and asylum to those of its members who weren't able to develop a new social life. In 1927, it bought an old castle in moussy le vieux near Paris, where its most vulnerable members would receive treatment and live in retreat from society. The acquisition was financed by a call for donations among the members of the association. However, the functioning costs were so expensive that the future of the institution remained un uncertain. Obviously, the internal, soli internal, so the, sorry, the internal soli solidarity of the association could not suffice anymore. New solutions had to be found if the girl Cassé wanted to pursue their activities. One possibility would have been to launch a call for donations, but the surprise effect would have been very limited. What the girl Cassé did innovate is in their search for techniques mixing the moral value of gift with the commercial excitement of gambling. <laughs> Entitled La Debt, the subscription they opened in the spring of 1931 was bound to play on two major emotional dispositions. On the one hand, the moral sense of indebtedness and reciprocity that the population inevitably felt towards the girl cassé. On the other, the greedy hope for sudden personal enrichment. Of course, charity lotteries weren't a new thing. The practice was common in the 19th century within the philanthropic movement, as well as in the 20s, early 20s, within the veterans movement. But the Girls' Cassettes Lottery, which, which was joined by a free over little association, was launched at a national level with the support of all the most respectable and powerful political authorities of the country. The, the operation, for instance, took place under the haut patronage of the President of the Republic, while several other ministers agreed to grant their patronage as well. The association also benefited from the moral authority of the Maréchal Pétain, uh, at the time a distinguished and popular figure, who was its honorary president. Such high-level endorsement testified to the political influence of the association's leaders, among which is its president, the Colonel Pico, uh, was doubtless the most famous and powerful in the interwar period. A member of the Chambre des Députés from 1919 to 1942, he was a typical example of this group of veterans who entered politics at the time of the Chambre Bleu Horizon. A resolute supporter of Poincaré, he spent a few weeks, only a few weeks, as Under Secretary of War in his government in 1927. His numerous, numerous political connections did a lot to ensure the success of the date operation. And here uh, you have a letter of the President of the Republic, which he sent in 1943, uh, thanking the association for its moral uh, engagement in this uh, operation. <coughs> However, the blessing of high officials did not suffice to guarantee the operation's success. More importantly, this private initiative benefited from the human and material support of the Banque de France, which opened its networks of local branches, the succursale, and customers to help sell the lottery tickets. The moral dimension of the operation also needed to be a fully successful, a genuine sense of organization and efficient sales methods. The particip participation of the bank was of course particularly welcome. Since the Great War, it had acquired a solid experience in selling bonds and loans to the population. 
But in spite of the pressing instructions they received from Paris, local directors expressed concern about their capacity to sell as many tickets as they were supposed to do. In various departments, reports highlighted the fact that the population did not have enough money to subscribe or were too much solicited and not so much interested in winning one of the prizes. The jackpots, how strange it may sound, were composed of 10 airplanes. And you also had other prizes, including thousands of uh, cars, motorcycles, and cycles. All these items were related to mobility and speed and were supposed to give a touch of modernity to the operation. But they did not always respond to the public's expectation, of course. As several Bank of France directors reported, the prizes were in a way ill-adapted to motivate potential subscribers. For the third and fourth drawings taking place in 1942 and 1943, prizes thus included much more classical rentes, uh, uh, <coughs> which better fitted with the perennial aspirations of French small owners to regular revenues and long-term security. But paradoxically, the Bank of France counters had to cope with the fierce competition of the girl cassé themselves who were very efficient in stimulating the efforts of their members across the territory. Officially, no commission could be received from the selling of a ticket, since a pure, I quote, disinterest was expected from the girl cassé and subscribers. However, those who would be able to prove that they had sold hundreds of tickets could participate in a raffle and get prizes for their effort. And the raffle was entitled Le Concours du Plus Bel Effort. And in 1933, a member of the association from Marseille received the first prize for having sold more than 3,000 tickets in only two years. So in the end, the operation was a clear success and four drawings were organized from 1941 to 1943. The association raised, as I told you before, more than 39 million francs, a significant amount of money which changed its position within the highly competitive landscape of war veterans associations. Interestingly, the functioning costs of the operation were particularly low, below 4%, showing how voluntarism made it possible to sell tickets widely with few expenses. Playing at the same time on the moral depth of citizens towards disabled veterans in need on, on the, their lure of gain proved dramatically efficient. <coughs> For once, a lottery organized at a national level by a private association had gained the support of the population and public authorities without provoking any negative comments on its commercial aspect. Therefore, the association could thank its banquier du coeur, merci, for their generous participation. But the story was not over. The closing of the debt did not mark the end of the girls' cassé involvement in lottery experiments. Still today, the association's official memory asserts that the debt paved the way for the re-legitimation re and recreation of the national lottery, the French national lottery, in 1933, after Parliament passed a law in May 1933. While such a link is harder to prove than often claimed, there is no denying that the debt brought legitimacy to lottery as an acceptable way to finance social policies and promote solidarity. Nobody could easily contest that disabled veterans had the right to defend their interests and raise money even through such a contested means. If the girl cassé could have done this for their own purpose, why wouldn't it be possible to extend it to a larger scale? A few years after the 1929 crack, and in the midst of a global economic depression, the French state was facing serious financial difficulties, always, as well as numerous demands from various social groups. While war veterans' pensions represented a heavy weight for the public finances, decreasing them proved to be almost impossible for any sensible politician, given the political and social weight of their associations, which had demonstrated, for instance, together in the fall of 1942 to protest against possible pension cuts. At the beginning of 1933, however, the Minister of Finances started to open discussion in search of a potential bargain. Rather than cutting the veterans' pensions, he proposed to create a one-year temporary lottery to finance them, which would allow him in return to lighten the general budget of the state. This proposal couldn't be more appropriate, given that war veterans associations had been instrumental in pleading for the recreation of some kind of national lottery since the early 20s. 
But for a long time, but for, for a long time, the moral and technical barriers that needed to be overcome seemed far too high. So, most of French politicians, economists, and high civil servants thought that lottery should be banned from any reasonable financial scheme. Their prejudices against such an, I quote, awful institution, uh, which was an expression, expression used by a senator during the parliamentary debates, dated back to the 19th century, when the bourgeois elite of the July monarchy forbade it in 1846. The classical argument was twofold, a very basic one. First, financing the state through lottery was considered a sign of backwardness, which would threaten the repetition and credit of the state. Lottery was seen as a tri trivial and uncertain budgetary tool, unfit for, I quote, civilized nation, endowed with the modern tools of taxation and public credit. Second, many political leaders and economists feared that lottery would corrupt the minds of poor citizens who would lose their appetite for saving and indulge in gambling, dreaming of a sudden and easy personal enrichment. Thus, lottery would threaten social order by creating undeserved wealth and demoralizing those who worked hard to make a living. In the end, it would simply alter the very sense of solidarity. The value of gift would be jeopardized by the interplay of greed and interest. Those arguments hold sway until the early 30s, when the girl cases experiment brought new arguments to the proponents of lottery. Even if evidence are scarce, it is clear that the debt helped convince some actors that a reintroduction of lottery in favor of favorite events could be legitimate, at least temporarily. That is why it was decided, when the law was passed, that the sums collected through the lottery would be earmarked, affected, to finance war pensions. So you have uh, one of the first official pictures of the National Lottery in 1933, and you cl can clearly see the earmarking process with the helmet of uh, uh, war veterans being presented at the same time, and reminding the people that they are playing the lottery, but also helping to finance the pensions of uh, uh, the veterans. For national, the lottery relied on the participation of a wide range of actors, either public or private. Whereas, according to, to the law passed in May 1933, the state and the Minister of Finance were in charge of its organization, they were not willing to support the cost of it. Lottery was supposed to bring money without costing too much. For finance officials, the state was not sufficiently qualified to launch commercial and marketing activities. Therefore, it should primarily rely on the experience and networks of veterans' association. That's why several representatives of the veterans' movement were consulted to see how their various associations could contribute to the success of the operation. Public officials were nonetheless hesitant. They needed the veterans' participation to sell lottery tickets but feared that these associations would seize this opportunity to claim for a sort of monopoly on the resources raised, therefore privatizing the lottery benefits. Rapidly, the War Veterans Associations, who were involved in the organizing committee of the National Lottery, jumped into the business of selling tickets. The girl Cassé, in particular, had gained considerable experience with the debt and could take advantage of it. In 1935, they started to issue what was called the dixième or tenth of lottery tickets. This, the tickets sold by the National Lottery were pretty expensive, 100 francs each, by the time standard, and few people could really afford it. So various organizations took the initiative, without referring to the official administration of the lottery, to buy tickets and split them in smaller pieces, the dixième, to sell them at lower prices. If one ticket win the prize, the various holders of dixième would share the winnings, and when the, this practice, when let, left out of control, could lead to scandals and misdemeanors since not all intermediaries were perfectly honest, nor did act in the name of philanthropy. Commercial agencies, crooks, and others tried to enter this business which could severely harm the reputation of the lottery. That is precisely where the girl Cassé played a crucial role. Contrary to others, they could easily combine efficient selling techniques with moral integrity. The organizing committee of the lottery does so a double interest in relying upon such an association. They would bear the cost of issuing smaller tickets while providing lottery with moral respectability. 
The reputation would also avoid by bad publicity in the press. The girl cassette ticket soon inspired great trust among the players, who perceived them both as reliable and profitable in as much as they win jackpots several times in 1945 and 1946. And you have uh, two pictures representing winners receiving the prizes from the hands of uh, the president of the association at the headquarters of the associations in Paris. Not surprisingly, the girl cassette's ability to sell tickets provoked tensions within the veterans' movement since several associations competed with each other to gain supremacy in this new business. In 1946, the Journal of the Girl Cassé complained about the campaign organized by other veterans' associations, which they saw as driven by envy and resentment towards them. Undeniably, solidarity had become a competitive business, and the Girl Cassé had been the most successful in taking advantage of it. They had perfectly managed to transform the moral sentiments they were inspiring into a source of revenue. For their own good and for the state's one, their moral legitimacy had given birth to a new institution that was to flourish even more after World War II. So let me say a few words of conclusion. Although it only took place between 1941 and 1943, the debt had long-term effects for the girl cassette themselves, of course, for the state, and for the populariz popularization of lottery games within French society. The association was, of course, the major beneficiary of this operation. It had succeeded in raising millions of francs and gained considerable experience to enter the business of issuing and selling lottery tickets from 1945 onwards. Today, few people know, but maybe you know, that the Gueule Cassé own around 9% of the capital of La Française des Jeux, which is the, uh, uh, the inheritor of uh, the National Lottery, a fact inherited from this period when the memory of war and the mobilization of veterans' association brought more legitimacy to a game that had been despised for several decades. The state, secondly, of course, did also greatly benefit from this situation, even if the law passed in 1943 was supposed to be temporary. So that was a temporary creation that is still existing today. Since then, the lottery has survived all attempts that have been made to suppress it. As soon as 1943, this funding scheme provided the state with more than 700 million francs and became a welcome additional source of financing. However, this national lottery was not a purely public affair. From the very beginning, the state counted on private actors to bring their selling skills and moral reputations to the game. Whereas the opponents of lottery discarded it as a voluntary tax on the poor, the participation of veterans' association helped transform its significance to the public's eye. The major effect of the debt experience had been to blur the boundaries between gift and gambling, solidarity and interest. It had infused the, hip, the appeal of flattery with, with a feeling of moral obligation and reciprocity, something that was far less clear after 1945, when the lottery became a mass and commercial show whose resources ceased to be earmarked in favor of war veterans. Thank you very much for your attention.